You're listening to the Unsiloed Podcast with Greg LeBlanc, produced by University FM. Unsiloed is a series of interdisciplinary conversations that inspire new ways of thinking about our world. So wherever you are, enjoy today's episode, and here's your host, Greg LeBlanc. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with John Ioannidis, who is at the Stanford Medical School in a variety of roles, right? Medicine, epidemiology, a couple other things. Population <laughs> health, uh, population health. data science, yeah. and, uh, also in statistics. Also in the statistics department. And you are famous for a bunch of articles. The, probably the most famous article is one that I started using in my statistics class, gosh, maybe back in 2010 or so. And, and it's this one, why most published research findings are false. And I think you sit at the intersection of statistics, epidemiology, and medicine. I think a lot of us as consumers of medicine, we tend to think that all the stuff that the doctors are doing for us, right, is well-grounded in science, right? There's a process by which these things are, you know, vetted and discovered and analyzed and, and examined to make sure that these are legit. But we also rely on statistical results in all sorts of domains. And so I guess the main question I would have is all of us who are teaching in the world of statistics, right, we teach this methodology of hypothesis testing, right, which goes all the way back to Ronald Fisher. And it's designed to protect us from experimenter bias, right, experimenter preferences, right? The thing that we're trying to prove, like the burden of proof is on that. Right. And that's why we have these p values, and that's why they're relatively small and so forth. And yet, I think the thrust of your work is saying this methodology is inadequate. It basically lets through far too much junk. And this type one error, which we're trying to minimize, we actually, it's nowhere near as small as we think it is. Right. So, why, I mean, why isn't that method was designed to protect us from the thing that you think is the major problem? It's not just one method, it's it's multiple methods. So I, I think that there's some popular methods that appear in millions of papers and some others that appear in fewer millions of papers and some others that are perhaps even a little better but appear even more rarely. We try to make inferences. We, we try to understand the world. We try to understand associations. We try to understand effects. We try to, in medicine at least, eventually understand effects that would save lives and not harm people. In the process, our statistical methods can help. They can set some rules, they can set some principles, but even under the best circumstances, we can get things very often just be wrong. Under ideal circumstances. Under real circumstances, we have an extra layer of multiple factors, including zillions of biases, problems with how our reward system is operating and what kind of incentives we have that kind of reward extreme results and very spectacular results at, at the cost of probably not getting accurate results. We have an overlay of problems with how we publish in the scientific literature with uh, many selection forces that shape what eventually will be published and how and how exactly it will be reported. We have the benefit of science being very successful and having many brilliant scientists working on scientific problems, but most of the time not joining forces to try to arrive at a coherent, collaborative team effort that would lead to a, a more trustworthy result, but mostly competing against each other because we have limited funding and, and we need to survive in, in that fight uh, of uh, who is the best who will uh, get that funding. And we have lots of conflicts of interest. Uh, across most medical fields, both my medical fields, there's a, a huge budget of our society and of trade. And I think that uh, that creates extra tension and extra desires of stakeholders to get particular results. Many, most, I would say probably in many cases, all of these problems appear also in other scientific fields. To a lesser or even higher degree, they may have a constellation of that mix of contributing factors that make for a perfect storm. It makes our life difficult in trying to arrive at accurate estimates and uh, accurate inferences about whether there is something here or there's none, or maybe there is, but we are exaggerating in terms of, of how we estimate it. Well, maybe we can walk through all of the problems individually. I mean, the one that is 
probably the most obvious is this idea that with a p-value of 5%, 5% of these junk studies right, will turn out to look significant. I mean, if you throw a whole bunch of compounds, you know, you say the, whatever, the witch's wart and the, and, you know, the frog's tail, all those things, right, that are totally garbage, right, 5% of them are going to show up as, as significant. I mean, that's the most basic problem. But I think most people understand that, that issue, even if it does get forgotten at some point. Well, it's uh, far worse than that under ideal circumstances, again, because the, actually the proportion of the results that we feel or we think that we have discovered something, because we cross that threshold of less than 0.05 as a p-value, can be very, very high. It could be 50%, it could be 90%, it could be 99% of those quote-unquote discoveries could be false depending on what field we're working on. So if, if we're working in a field that is very difficult to make discoveries because the proportion of things to be discovered versus how many things we can check and measure and evaluate is very tiny, a, a p-value that is less than 0 0.05 is not going to be raising that proportion of truly discovered effects very much. A significant result would still be vastly more likely to be a false finding in that case. Right. So some people have said, well, why don't we just, in fact, you were co-author on a paper that said, why don't we just cut this 0.05 down to 0.005? I mean, that right. should so, do the so trick, right? Reduce it, the number this of... This is kind of a poor man's uh, suggestion, <laughs> especially for prior literature, that there's nothing mm -hmm. uh, that you can do. The study has been done and it's published mm -hmm. and you see some results. I think that if you do this, you do lose some discoveries and some effects that are genuine because you ask for more stringent uh, criteria. But most likely in most scientific fields, you will discard a lot of noise that just happened to pass the P less than 0 0.05 threshold. It doesn't make it to the 0 0.005. It was not genuine effects, genuine associations that uh, you don't want to lose. So it's a very kind of simplistic adjustment. Mm -hmm. I think in most fields, it will help. Now, many fields already do this. Many fields are more sophisticated. Some fields use p-values of less than to the minus eight or 10 to the minus nine in many of the omics fields because they have clearly recognized that they have a big problem otherwise and they would just be flooded with noise if they didn't do this. But most fields are probably stuck to using these very mm -hmm. lenient thresholds that are a recipe for disaster even if everything was perfect. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're very far from perfection and all the other factors that we just uh, discussed. Well, I mean, is, is the problem now worse because it's cheaper to test hypotheses, right? I mean, you can test 10,000 hypotheses with the push of a button. I mean, in the old days, if you're gonna test a hypothesis, I mean, you had to come up with a theory and then you had to, right? You know, you had to get resources. And so you had to be pretty confident that there was some kind of substantive, theory behind it. Now you could just throw a whole bunch of data into right an algorithm and it's going to crank stuff out. I mean, one of the examples that I use in my stats class is that famous article about the salmon in the MRI, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the dead salmon, I should say, dead that, salmon. That, right? Yep. With various, Had you know, lots, box, of activity. <laughs> lots of activity in certain areas. And so, I mean, now in the world of, particularly in the investment world, right, you can throw 50,000 indicators into a, a black box model and it will come out with stuff that has almost like a perfect R squared, right? And, but right. it doesn't work out a sample. And so is the movement towards big data, I mean, it, this must just be making the problem so much worse. So I have no problem with big data. I, I think it, it would be not a safe strategy to say that we should limit ourselves to very limited information. If we have information that's in principle good news, but we should just be prepared for what it means and what it means in handling it and in trying to make inferences based on information that, first of all, is usually not collected for research purposes. Mm -hmm. So there's problems with measurement error and with information biases and misclassification and just in simple words, plain junk information mm -hmm. <laughs> that even if what it was trying to measure did have something to be revealed. The way that it is measured is not going to tell us much. So a lot of electronic health records and a lot of personal mobile phones type of collected information is so noisy 
that even if there's something that the fact that it's so noisy makes it very difficult to be useful. But beyond that, we have the problem of this multidimensionality and the fact that most of the things that we measure probably are not likely to be causally related to what we want to study. And they're probably uh, just there be just because we could measure them, <laughs> not, not because we wanted to or because we had any hint or, or suggestion that it was worth measuring, but they, they're just there uh, regardless of whether we want them or not. So practically the prior probability of the average measurement for the average variable to be informative is probably very low, lower compared to what we had under circumstances where we focused very specifically on things that we had some evidence, perhaps prior evidence that uh, they would matter. And we had some other reasons to believe that they would. Th th this means that the average discovery now probably, yes, it tends to have an even lesser chance of being correct. You can think of this also in terms of low hanging fruit and normal science to use the Kuhnian type of language, low hanging fruit. We have 40 million people who have published scientific papers. If they were there, one of us must have noticed them. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very difficult to say that that low hanging fruit of major effects, very strong associations, clear causal pathways that could be measured for a while could not be noticed by anyone among that huge scientific workforce. And of, of course, not everyone is working in the same field, but cumulatively, I think we have many eyes and many brains and, and many people who would be interested. So I think that most of what we're trying to find is small and subtle and mm -hmm. very often tiny effects that they could have value, especially if we can map them out and learn about thousands and millions of them and put them together. That would be valuable information. But this means that our life is more difficult in a sense. So our data are bigger, our tools are hopefully more sophisticated. Our statistical methods have improved and also some of the know-how about statistics and data science has become a bit more widely disseminated. There's still a lot of statistical illiteracy, even among scientists who do work without really proper scientific statistical training. And the odds when we start in most fields, we start from a more difficult point with lower pre-study probability. Yeah, I mean, I'm most familiar with the studies in the world of social sciences, right? And so particularly in the world of social psychology, right? That's where the reproducibility crisis has really been most pronounced. But I mean, aren't there kind of ways to reduce our overconfidence in these results through disclosure, right? So for instance, people talk about the file drawer effect and mm -hmm. they say, okay, I'm only going to show you the results that are good. Well, if I know that you did one test and it came out statistically significant versus I know you did 20 tests and it came out statistically significant, shouldn't that modify the degree of confidence th that I have in your results? Or if I know that you p-hacked, right? You changed your variables multiple times and you tried a bunch of transformations and you just yeah. played around with all this stuff until you got some juicy results. Yeah. Yeah. If we know something about the way the sausage is made, can we incorporate that into our evaluation process? Is there a formal method that we can use? The to Transparency should help. And I think that there has been a lot of effort from uh, many scientists in many fields to try to improve transparency. And there's different ways that we can do that by sharing data and data sets in their entirety, rather than just the isolated fragments that seem to be more interesting by sharing the code, the algorithm, the software that has been used, the whole process of what exactly was done and how and why, and also pre-registration of the protocol, uh, even better of the statistical analysis plan. So someone has thought ahead of time of what exactly is to be done and, and now one can compare notes. That was the promise and this is what was delivered. In principle, all of these approaches should help because they kind of give us a, a, a better picture of the landscape of the scientific investigation rather than just depend on what is very selectively reported in the literature, which may be a very biased mm -hmm. uh, subset of all the analysis being done and then reviewed and then published and uh, circulated and, and disseminated and, and interpreted. There's, there's biases at all of these mm -hmm. steps that lead to uh, a more distorted picture. So if, if we see the whole chain and we have the ability to see the whole chain, 
maybe we can do better. I have to say that have we done randomized trials <laughs> to prove that these approaches do lead to more reliable science? And here the evidence is pretty scant. It, it, so it, it, these are ideas that we hope and there's reason to believe that will make things better. But for many of them, we don't know how much is the improvement that we can achieve. So I think that it is important to test different interventions that enhance transparency in specific scientific fields, in specific settings, in specific readings of the final re literature and what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. I think that we run the risk of over-proposing solutions because now we realize that there's a problem. I think that after so many years of going through debates about the replication crisis, it's very difficult to believe that serious scientists would say, oh, we have absolutely no problem. But we also have many solutions and many interventions that are being proposed, kind of struggling to save mm -hmm. our work from being just wasted. And many of them create extra challenges and extra limits to, to what we can do. So we, we, we don't want to kill science or make science mm -hmm. more difficult. We want to make it easier. We want to make it more efficient. We want to make it uh, more reliable. Yeah, and I, and I want to talk more about this idea of the science of science. But before we do that, I mean, I was thinking about this study by Daryl Bem, right? You know, this famous study on ESP. It's another one that I, I teach in, in my class. And, and I think a lot of people would say, we shouldn't treat results like around ESP the same way we would treat results around stuff that seems more likely. So in other words, mm -hmm. if we take a Bayesian approach, we're, yes. we're going to start with a prior. And then based on our prior, the amount of evidence that we need is going to differ. So how can we incorporate that into what we do as, as scientists? I mean, because you have to have some way of determining what the prior is. And, right. and oftentimes that prior may get in the way of novel discoveries, right? I mean, there was a geocentric prior, right, mm -hmm. at, at one point, and it, it kind of got in the way, it made the burden of proof a little bit too high for the folks who are interested in advocating a, a heliocentric world. So how, how do we do this in a more Bayesian way? So I, I think that this is a more natural way to think. Unfortunately, the vast majority of published papers uh, do not use Bayesian approaches. I think that we can boost that. As you very well know, prior elicitations and anything that has to do with priors does have a lot of debate associated with it because different priors would lead to different conclusions about what the posterior is based on the information and the data that is available. However, I think that some fields are on a bit more safer ground compared to others. For example, in many fields, we have a lot of empirical evidence which can be used in building empirical priors. And I think that we can borrow evidence from other similar circumstances in the same field. The good thing about science is that now it's so productive. And the fact that we have all these millions of people who are working very hard and very smart people producing data and studies and, and results, we do have a much larger basis that w we can learn from our experience, w which is our priors. And we increasingly have also a layer of replication efforts and reproducibility efforts to try to tell us a little bit about what that vast enterprise has produced and how probably we should rate it in different fields. There will be differences of opinion. There will be differences of inferential reproducibility because people will look at the same data and exactly the same numbers and exactly the same studies, and they will think differently about them. If someone believes in BEM's work and, and thinks that, that this is so and prior is 100%, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be mm. possible to move that person from that solid dogmatic view. But I think that our ability to try to empirically replicate and see that this doesn't hold true upon multiple replication mm -hmm. efforts is giving us empirical grounding that makes someone who wants to say, no, I still believe it and I believe it very strongly, Th that person would be an outlier by all means. Do we need conformity that every scientist should agree to exactly the same prior and the same posterior, because the posterior could also change with the same prior. People mm -hmm. modify or manipulate or slice the data or, or cut them in different ways. No, we cannot do that. The, uh, science is a living organism. It, it evolves 
and some room for debate is always welcome. I think it's important though to, to make clear why there is debate. Where is the difference in, in what assumptions, in what priors, in, in what uh, acceptance or dismissal of some parts of the data in what analytical machinery choice has been made and in how we read the results to make an interpretation. So recording and, and mapping our, our debate can, can be very helpful. And, and we can see that in some cases, it's not that big of an issue. And in other cases, it is a big issue and, and very well credentialed scientists reach different conclusion on the very same problem, mm -hmm. just because they see different aspects of use, different inferential machinery or have different readings of the data. And th this is fine. This is fine, provided that it is transparent and communicated with the pros and cons and the arguments and the assumptions that other scientists can also judge to see, well, this looks more likely to be an acceptable approach versus that one. Now, I'm, I'm not really a statistician. I teach it, but I'm more of an organizational economist. And so I'm, I'm really interested in the industrial organization of knowledge production, right? Scientific knowledge production. And we have a system here in the U.S. which is, you know, exceptionally good at manufacturing knowledge. But at the same time, it's incredibly inefficient, I think, right? I mean, you could presumably get more knowledge <laughs> with fewer resources. And how can we do that? I mean, one feature is that it's highly decentralized. So even though yeah. we do have the NIH and lots of, you know, NSF funding a lot of research, I mean, every researcher is trying to make a mark and every researcher is trying to become famous and win that Nobel Prize. <laughs> and, and one of the implications of your work is that the more prestigious the result, the more prestigious the publication, the less reliable, <laughs> right? There's a selection bias in favor of the results that are transformative, that are impactful, that are exciting. And yet those are the ones that turn out to be non-reproducible at the highest rate. So are those incentives to produce more impactful work, also the same incentives that promote wasteful research? Incentives are, are a core feature in driving what we want to get out of science. Scientists are very bright people, are very smart, and they will do their best to try to fit to whatever orders are given to them. Mm -hmm. So if they're told you need to get extreme, extravagant, extraordinary results, they will come up with them because that's what will allow them to continue doing what they enjoy and what they love. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that, that, that they're criminals mm -hmm. <laughs> in doing it. They, they just want to do science and continue to do science. So we need to find ways that our reward and incentive system is aligned with the expectation not being spectacular, but flawed results, but accurate results. So we pay a lot of attention to productivity, for example, and I have nothing against productivity. I love doing research. I love publishing papers, and I think that there's nothing wrong with it. But we also need to give more attention to aspects of methodological rigor, of mm -hmm. quality, of transparency, of reproducibility, translational potential, societal contribution, things that don't count in many environments as much as they should count, and very often they don't count at all. So if we continue with just get me the most extreme results, we will get the most extreme results. But we know theoretically, and it has been shown empirically, that the most extreme results are likely to suffer the, the most regression to the mean at a minimum and suffer the winner's curse. That's mm -hmm. another way to see it. Or just be far more likely as well to be completely wrong. So just false positives that among all these millions of people searching and doing their best, you were lucky to find the most extreme result. You were unlucky to find the most extreme result. Well, look, we have the same problem in finance, right? So you can get a bonus for making what appears to be a profitable trade. And then a couple of years later, when it unravels, the, <laughs> the motto in, in banking is, I'll be gone, you'll be gone, right? Yes. <laughs> I'll have my bonus, you'll have your bonus. But isn't that the idea behind the Nobel Prize? I mean, we wait until people are like 80 years old so that we can <laughs> see if their results st stood the test of time. I mean, do we need more long-term rewards, right? So in, in banking now, you, you got to park your bonus. <laughs> if anything uh -huh. happens, then they, they claw back the, the bonus. Yeah. Well, I don't think we can wait for decades because science moves very quickly mm -hmm. and things are decided within a year, 
sometimes a few months, sometimes even a few weeks may make a difference. And science is something that you do every day. I mean, you cannot say, oh, I will wait until I'm 80 years old before I do my second step, because by then I will know whether I was right or wrong. You need to continue doing your work today, tomorrow, and not stop. And the same applies for every scientist. So I, I think that a more healthy perspective would be to have the, the right amount of, of uncertainty associated with everything that we have come up with and everything that we have presented and, and published and say that, well, this is what I have found and I'm trying to be transparent and complete and thorough in reporting it. But it comes with a lot of uncertainty or sometimes it may come with less or little uncertainty. That's mm -hmm. also a possibility. And especially with accumulating evidence from multiple studies and multiple sciences, I think the uncertainty will tend to shrink to very low levels. But putting the, the proper amount of uncertainty is essential. And uncertainty does not include just the statistical computation of a variance. It, it has other dimensions that include all of these features of bias, competition, environment, circumstances that the research is being done that tend to inflate the uncertainty substantially beyond what is just the pure calculation of a variance around an effect size. So you're saying in science, we have bubbles, right? So in financial markets, right? You know, everyone's like, all hey, crypto, time. let's all buy crypto. And yeah. so you'll have some genomics result or some neuroscience result, and then all sorts of resources will flow into that sector and then take a couple of years before you realize that it was overhyped? Yeah, we do. And I think we, we see that in every scientific field. The difference is what is the tempo? What is the speed? What mm -hmm. is the velocity that a scientific field can move? There are some fields that can uh, really create crisis to themselves mm -hmm. every day <laughs> because their measurements are very fast and, and you can run the analysis in real time and everything can be decided very quickly. There's other fields that you need to run a randomized trial that lasts for 10 years. And for 10 mm -hmm. years, you're waiting to see what the results would be. And uh, maybe you're, the investigator is dead by then. <laughs> like diet, like diets, right? <laughs> nutritional interventions. Well, I mean, for things that look at death, especially yeah. for healthy people, if really what you want to see is whether these people will live longer, that would take a very long mm -hmm. time. Uh, of course, for people with disease, especially serious disease, you can have studies with death outcomes pretty promptly. And we've seen that in situations of crisis. We saw that during the pandemic. We had mm -hmm. mega trials looking at multiple treatments and getting results within a few months mm -hmm. that were pretty decisive that this treatment seems to work like steroids, for example, or this mm -hmm. treatment like hydroxychloroquine does not work. And we could get these results within months. Mm -hmm. People used to say that no randomized trials take forever. They're the deathbed of the assistant professor. Don't mm -hmm. do them. I don't think that that's true. Very often we can accelerate the timing of our processing of discovery, mm -hmm. evaluation, replication, refutation, integration, and making some sense, uh, or, or at least making enough sense to move on pretty quickly without having lost a lot of resources investing on something mm -hmm. that was a dead end. I think that finding ways to improve the efficiency and to maximize the allocation of our resources to the best designs, to the best agenda, to the strategy of building an agenda around scientific questions, I think that's what's really most important because otherwise we will be wasting a lot of effort on leads that are just dead ends, they don't go anywhere mm -hmm. and hundreds and thousands of scientists will be wasting their time, their money and their uh, fellows time to, yeah. to try to, to resurrect a dead theory. Well, you've talked a lot about collaboration, right? So mm -hmm. the power of an experiment is very important and you see a lot of these low powered experiments being done. Presumably they're studying the same stuff in different places. And yeah. if they could somehow pool the resources, you get better results. And one application of this, I think that you've written about is with animal experiments, and we're trying to conserve the number of animals who sacrifice their lives for these trials. And so a lot of people try to keep their sample size small, but then what that ultimately does is means that we're going to have to do it again, right, to, yes. just to validate. So it, is one solution to come up with better ways of collaborating? And if we don't do that, then what's the role of these meta-studies? How can meta-studies give us insight that we wouldn't get from individual studies? Collaboration in principle is wonderful, and it can lead to 
reducing the need of resources to get an answer with a level of certainty and certainty that is acceptable, that we can fairly well settle the question and, and move on. And, and we've seen that work in many scientific fields. We've seen that in the physical sciences with very large collaborations on issues of particle physics and astrophysics and telescopes and all sorts of information where instead of having each scientist build his own accelerator in his backyard, they join forces and they all work on a common goal. We have seen that in lots of biological sciences. We've seen that in genetics where people have moved away from the example of solo siloed scientists running small studies on a few genes and trying to come up with a few papers to large collaborations where everyone is contributing their samples and their readings and their results. And uh, that has an inherent process of replication across all these scientists who can see that do we all get the same signal? Do we get similar at least, or is there heterogeneity? We have seen it in medicine. We have seen it in medicine with large multi-center trials uh, that again can be more definitive in terms of giving us an answer with the uh, right amount of uncertainty, not too much. So I think that all of these examples are in principle helpful. They may decrease also the extent of selection biases. Uh, if really the collaboration is transparent, it's not as easy for someone to hide results or kind of distort results because there's many eyes looking at uh, what is going on. And I think that many fields also are experimenting with different types of collaboration, with different types of tackling some of the analytical challenges that go beyond sample size, for example, multi-analyst studies, where you have multiple investigators attacking the same data set, and each one of them applies their own assumptions and their own choices of analytical models. And then they can compare notes and say, for that data set and for that question that we set, how different are the results that we got when we try to attack that data set and, and see what, what we get? I, I think uh, there's many ways that sharing and talking to each other and putting our heads together, sharing also data, combining data can help. Now, when this has not happened, or maybe even when it has happened, there's the opportunity that someone could combine data sets after the fact, uh, based on whatever is uh, scattered in the literature, and uh, then becoming also a bit of an archeologist and doing excavations to try to find unpublished results and great literature and thesis and uh, file drawer <laughs> content and, and so forth. Uh, good luck. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think it's not easy to do it after the fact. What can be done after the fact is appraise what are most likely the, the biases and the key problems and the key risk signals that exist in that body of literature. And yes, try to get a synthesis that would be better powered, of course, mm -hmm. compared to the single studies. But if the primary studies are underpowered and they're very poorly done and there's huge selection forces operating in the field and huge bias on what gets eventually published, you know, the meta-analysis will not save the day. It will just solidify the bias mm -hmm. and make it more prominent because we have bias times 10 instead of bias in, in a single study, we have bias accumulating across the entire field. So very useful still, mostly for the first function of understanding the problems in the field and the issues with rigor and, and methodological principles, and also getting a sense of where are the results and how different are they, and perhaps why they might be different. And the more detailed insights we want to get, the more difficult it is to do it after the fact. If we have a plan ahead of time, this is always better. And it could be that it doesn't have to be a coalition where everybody's giving everything to just a common pot. People could still retain their independence, but there could be an understanding that uh, they all belong to a set of registered studies, that there's a plan to do a meta-analysis prospectively. So we will not lose anyone. We will not miss any of the action. Everything eventually will be combined. There's a plan. There's some thinking ahead of what are we going to do. Well, there are lab studies, of course, but there's also field studies. And in the world of medicine, you've got people going into hospitals every day, and these people are potential subjects. Is there a benefit to coordinating, say, the rolling out of different interventions, right, in the clinical setting? I mean, if, if every doctor is left to their own devices and every doctor says, well, I think this is the best thing to do, then you don't have any randomization, 
Mm-hmm. Right. And so yeah. particularly when we had COVID, people were trying to figure out what worked and what didn't work. If, if you let the doctors decide, oh yeah, let's use a ventilator, or let's not based on their own personal judgment, then you, you'll never really know, right? With any degree of accuracy, what the impact of that intervention is. is. How, how can you bake learning into the process? I mean, companies do this all the time with customers, yes. but, but the, the, the worst thing that can happen is you might lose a little bit of sales during the AB test. The worst thing that can happen in the clinical setting is you just lose a couple of lives, right? So, I mean- well. I, I think actually, if if you do it the right way, you're you're not going to waste lives. You're going to save lives. And I think that medicine could learn a lot from the massive scale that A/B testing is conducted in some other fields, mostly commercial, mm-hmm. but pretty effectively. What we have learned from A/B testing is that, first of all, our our prior beliefs are not very solid in, or not very accurate. Uh, so if uh, people try to make guesses of what will be effective and what will not, probably they're better than chance, but not much better than chance. Well, I mean, like with a sham knee surgery, okay. I mean, there you get these wonderful results. Nobody's harmed in the process. It's a win-win, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think we need to do more randomized trials within clinical settings. And I would argue we need more experimental designs across scientific fields. Of course, not all questions are possible to access with randomization. Lots of things that are harmful, obviously you cannot randomize someone to be exposed to radiation or not be exposed to radiation. But in the majority of scientific fields and the majority of scientific questions, we do have the option of randomization if we don't know. And I think that most of the time we can do these randomizations better, more efficiently, and uh, with better cost-benefit ratios compared to what is done now. There's a lot of waste in the randomized world at the moment. So even though I'm a proponent of randomized trials, I see that there's a lot of them being done with very little rationale. But is that, I mean, can you do it in a way that's consistent with the Hippocratic Oath, right? I mean, if you're in the B leg, right, and you're told, oh, don't do this, but you have a personal conviction that you should be doing this. I mean... Well, it depends on whether that conviction is uh, based on some evidence or how strongly you can support it. The, The question of equipoise is always a difficult one. And I'm not going to argue that uh, everyone will have the same equipoise perspective. We we discussed already that people have different views and, and sometimes these views diverge very substantially, especially in situations where there's dearth of evidence. And in many Mm -hmm. cases where we think about a randomized trial, there is a dearth of evidence. There will be divergent views. But I would argue with dearth of evidence, these are just views. These are opinions. So I would say in order to settle that in the best possible way, and it will never be 100% settled for sure, but at least get as close to what might be an accurate estimate is to do a randomized trial. And we can do that probably with less cost and more efficiency than what we waste at the moment, trying to cut Mm. corners here and there, accumulate all these huge databases with routinely collected data that people say, well, this is routinely collected. We would have collected them anyhow, and they cost nothing. No, not really. I mean, they can cost millions and billions. (laughs) And, you know, just the treatments being given they could cause billions. Yeah. Uh, so why not run one or two good randomized trials? They would cost far, far, far less. And they're not going to be perfect, yes, but they will be very close to the answer that we would need to get. I feel that we are running a lot of studies that we just run them because it's easy to run them. And I feel that temptation myself. I'm getting bombarded with data sets and I say, okay, well, why don't I take a look at that? That's so, like the drunk lamppost, right? Yeah, you know, you've got the... Exactly. Uh, and and I, th- I think it would be best if we could just take a step back and uh, resist that temptation. Mm-hmm. Just say, well, is that good enough to give me an answer? Or is it going to confuse me even more? And If it's likely that it will just confuse me even more, I would have to let it aside and say, okay, let me think about what is really the design? What is the study or studies that I need to do to try to get an answer as quickly as possible? Because indeed people are dying and I do want that answer pretty quickly, but getting the wrong answer implemented quickly is not going to save lives. I want to talk about bias a bit because 
We now require scientists and investigators to reveal any conflicts of interest, right? Where'd you get the money from? Yes. So if it's the the tobacco industry that's funding you, right, and you come up, wait, check it out. Smoking's good for you, right? We're going to be a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. But is there... Uh, If smoking is funny, I would not even look at the study. (laughs) I would just put it in the waste. But (laughs) but, hey, I mean, is bias? How big is that problem? And we can't count on the NSF to fund everything. And they too have perhaps well, they have their biases, own biases of, of their yes. own. So how do you measure and control for bias? And I guess part two of that question is, is it different when you're talking about in-house research where the, the shareholders are kind of putting their money on the line? And if these results turn out to be bogus results, I mean, they're going to ultimately wind up losing their money. So right. is there a difference between industry-funded research that's done in-house versus industry-funded research that is contracted out to to each academics? So I think there's different types of funding that have different connotation. You mentioned tobacco, and my immediate reaction was, I don't want to see any study that is funded by the tobacco industry. We know that eight plus million people are dying every year. We know that the tobacco industry is just producing things that kill people. We know that they have all these sorts of tricks with their very smart lawyers and advertisers who who can really turn black to white and vice versa. I don't want to see any of that. I'm not going to pay any attention to anything that the tobacco industry will fund, period. (laughs) And actually, I would be very unhappy to to see more work being funded by the tobacco industry. Then there's uh, many other industries that are producing or aim to produce products that may have real value. It's not that that, uh, they they kill people. They aim to save lives or improve lives or improve uh, the quality of our experience. And there we are at a very different ballpark. And in, in that case, I think we need to evaluate who needs to develop that drug, that device, that vaccine, that uh, technology, and who needs to evaluate it. Uh, practically, in most cases, what we do is that we put the burden of evaluation on the sponsor and the manufacturer. Hmm. I think this is not a good idea because yes, they will do this because if we say you need to show me that you have evaluated and it is worth it, it is effective, it doesn't have much of a a harmful repercussions, they will do their best to create a picture of evidence that is commensurate to what we have asked. And it's not that they will necessarily do poor science. Uh, In the past, a lot of industry funded science had lots of drawbacks that were very easily revealed by methodologists. And now that we have many sensitized methodologists, they're not going to fall easily for this type of things that are very easily discernible. And very quickly, someone will say, oh, look at that. That was completely uh, bogus. And I'm not going to put much attention. The bogus things do happen still in industry sponsored research, mostly when regulators allow this. But if regulators do not allow it, then the industry, they're not fools. They're going to spend so much money to try to value their product. They will try to make me, you, and the regulators happy so that Johnny and his will not scream. There's a methodological Mm -hmm. problem here. And the regulators will say, okay, you fulfilled my criteria. The problem becomes, though, when there's many empty blind spots that are still left based on the environment on what is required by regulators or by the community. And then the industry might use these blind spots. Mm -hmm. So for example, they might use blind spots in terms of what outcomes to choose. They will choose surrogate outcomes if they're allowed to choose Mm -hmm. surrogate outcomes that regulators are happy with. They will not even do randomized trials if the regulators say, well, just show me some uncontrolled data. So a surrogate outcome would mean, right, we're worried about the impact of high cholesterol because we see it correlates with early death. We have a drug that will reduce cholesterol. We don't test to see if it actually lengthens life expectancy. (laughs) And then we we just, we 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 stop there. We care about your blood test. We don't care about you. Yeah, yeah. And and sometimes the blood test do tell us a lot about what will happen Uh to you. But there's a very big distance from a a blood test and whether you live or or die. Mm -hmm. So I I think it is important that the, the game is transparent and it asks the right criteria to claim who's the winner and who's the loser. 
And then coming back to who will run this evaluation, I think to get uh, rid of the temptation more thoroughly, I would argue that the real pivotal studies that would lead to licensing, for example, and then creating a blockbuster market of, of billions of dollars, these need to be done by independent investigators. Mm -hmm. I would argue that public funds and independent investigators should be involved in that step where something moves from the world of science and curiosity mm -hmm. and interest and development to, well, now this is going to hit the market and it will be given to millions of patients and it will affect millions of lives. I think this should be done by independent investigators with public money. Now, where will that public money come from? Because there's not much and there's lots of smart scientists who need to get funding. I would argue probably one can shift money from development and translation of that intervention that is currently funded predominantly by public funds. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit weird, but basic blue sky science, federal funds, public funds need to fund it, no question, because otherwise who's going to do it? It would be great if some entrepreneur wants to do it, mm -hmm. but I want a lot of emphasis of public funding for this because it's curiosity that has no immediate deliverable. Nobody knows whether anything will come out of it. It could be 300 years mm -hmm. downstream. You're not going to get your money back 300 years down the road unless you want to give it to your ancestors 10 generations later. So that we need public money. But then translational, like developing a drug target and testing it out and trying to optimize it and see how you can move it to a product to be evaluated at the final step, that currently is funded a lot by public money. And I think that should be up to the companies mm -hmm. to fund primarily because they are the ones who want to make sure that they develop it in the best possible way that the technology, the product will be shaped in such a way that it will have a maximum chance of being effective and safe and beneficial. So uh, I think if we shift attention on who mm -hmm. is funding what, I think the conflict that exists, that is unavoidable, the sponsor wants to have a successful product, will probably no matter because the sponsor does get the best shot at developing the best intervention. And then the public arbitration is independent. And the sponsor is waiting anxiously to see what will happen out of it. Well, I mean, do we use different standards of proof for different types of medical interventions? I mean, yeah. when we think about a pharmaceutical product, I mean, you've got all these clinical trials and they cost a ton of money and you got stage one and stage two and stage three. And then when you think about other kinds of interventions, sometimes there's no testing at all. I mean, if you think about advice that the doctors give, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, eat this or don't eat this, right? Or I remember hearing from the CEO of Kaiser who was saying that they distributed bath mats to their elderly <laughs> citizens and okay. they got a reduction in hip fractures, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know. I don't think he did an A-B test, but there's a lot of different ways that you could reduce a fatality from a f fall in the shower. I mean, one is mats. One is yeah. advice. One is the way in which you do your surgery when they come in. The other is the types of antibiotics that you give them. And it's really only that last one that has gone through some kind of clinical trial. Do we need to start thinking about, I mean, during the pandemic, of course, we had pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions. And, and the pharmaceutical interventions seem to be pretty rigorously tested. The non-pharmaceutical, maybe not so much. So there's unevenness in uh, uh, how much we invest in testing different interventions. And some of that is justified because some interventions are easier to test compared to others. And uh, in some cases, uh, it's difficult to imagine how you can get to evaluate the real world impact as opposed to just an early artificial efficacy impact under idealized uh, circumstances. So sometimes we do have difficulties to run the proper study. So, so even in the world of pharmaceuticals, right, you're not accounting for compliance or adherence oh, yes, or, yes. or all I, that other I stuff, think, right? I think saying that pharmaceuticals are the gold standard, that, that <laughs> makes me very, very uneasy <laughs> because I, I think that pharmaceuticals, the, the way that they're tested and appraised and the regulatory oversight that they get uh, currently 2024 is very problematic. I think that the bar has been lowered uh, a lot and we do see a lot of pharmaceuticals that just get licensed. And when I see that, I say, okay, what that says is that now you can sell it. 
and get wealthy. <laughs> but, but I'm not really sure that mm-hmm. it's going to help. And I don't even know whether it's going to be safe and it's not going to be harmful. Of, of course, there are many exceptions that we have very rigorous evidence, but we have many, many things that go through FDA approvals that the evidence is very weak, very tenuous, close to nothing because of surrogate outcomes, because of design that is not really informative, because of very little information on harms, because of of many other issues that really leave a big question mark about, uh, are we really going to get benefit eventually now that this is out in the market? For other types of interventions, um, some uh, have uh, strong traditions for testing and others have very weak or non-existent traditions of testing. The mix of randomized and uh, non-randomized evidence also varies substantially. The rigor of both randomized and non-randomized evidence also varies tremendously. So I cannot give like an aphorism that mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all horrible and it, or it's let alone it's all worse than pharmaceuticals, which is not that great. But clearly, most fields have plenty of room to improve and not spend more money on evaluation. I would say spend less because you mentioned uh, diet and uh, advice. It's not that we don't have studies on them. We have actually tens of thousands of studies, mm-hmm. uh, randomized trials, and, and we have hundreds of thousands millions of papers on diet on the Mm -hmm. observational side. So that's a tremendous agenda with tremendous resources and effort and waste eventually. And we could have had probably a better grasp of whether some of the interventions work or not by doing fewer studies, but Mm -hmm. much better designed, more properly, more strategically placed, probably at one-tenth the cost Mm -hmm. overall, if not less for the entire agenda, maybe 100th the cost. <laughs> in some cases, if we place these trials strategically with a couple of randomized trials, we could just get rid of tens of thousands of papers that I have otherwise accumulated over time because people just knew to have a hammer and a nail. Mm-hmm. That's what they were doing all along instead of just doing the right study mm-hmm. at the right time. Now, you're also in epidemiology, and this recent pandemic is something that brought epidemiologists a lot of attention. And I know you were involved in a very early study. I think it was here in Santa Clara County in maybe March of 2020 or so. And I was very puzzled when the pandemic hit because the response, which, you know, can cost you trillions of dollars, the response that you're going to have as as public health officials depends on certain pieces of information. I mean, what's the R-naught? What's the IFR, right? What's the, what are the disease transmission dynamics and, and so forth. What's right. the, what are the other risk factors? And w- when I teach my students who are in business, particularly the ones that are doing startups, working in a, an environment where there's just enormous amount of uncertainty, I always say, prioritize which bits of the uncertainty you need to resolve earliest because they're going to have the biggest impact. So you do a sensitivity analysis and you figure out, well, I need to figure out my go-to-market before I figure (laughs) out what my features are and so forth. And so it would seem like public health officials would really, really want to get to know the answers to some of those questions as early as possible so as to design the proper responses. And my casual observations were that that was not the priority and that the, the policies were launched and initiated and they weren't trying to figure out like, hey, is this the right response? And and so Mm -hmm. one of the earliest attempts to reduce some of this uncertainty was was the study you did to get at the actual IFR. And I remember at the time, people were confusing CFR and IFR, and and there were people who were saying, this thing has a 20% fatality rate or a 3% fatality rate. And it, it seemed to me like this would be trying to figure out how dangerous skiing is by interviewing all the people who are in the clinic at the bottom of the hill. Right. So why wasn't there really strong demand and massive amounts of funding going into research to answer these critical questions earlier rather than kind of later in the process? I I, I think it's a multifactorial situation because what we saw during the pandemic, uh, we saw all the strengths of science and all the weaknesses of science. Uh, We knew all along all the problems that we were discussing re-emerged in a very acute, panic-stricken and highly debated and polarized environment. 
So we had the recipe for a disaster, unfortunately. And I think that you start with a new situation that has tremendous uncertainty. I think the reasonable thing to do is to follow a precautionary principle to try to minimize damage. And I, I see that as two-edged. One, try to deal with the new threat and try to minimize the damage from that threat immediately, as quickly as possible. And also try to make sure that what you do to minimize the damage does not create other problems until you find out what is the optimal response. And as you do that, and, and you do that immediately, you also immediately start to try to get the best possible data to inform you about the next steps. Because if it's a pandemic, it's not going to be a couple of weeks. It's probably going to be several years. So the argument that, well, we don't have time to do studies, do this, it makes absolutely no sense. If, if it were something that would be done within two weeks, yes. But if it's something that's two, three, four years, and actually with repercussions that we see now, have a tail that may go into decades and some of the repercussions mm -hmm. and the harms of, of the pandemic response and what we did or what we didn't do, then we need data. We need the best possible data. We need data as quickly as possible. So there's time and accuracy, and we need to get the best mm -hmm. combination of both. And I, I think that many scientists just try to do their best. And I think I'm just one of many scientists who try to do my best, regardless mm -hmm. of, of whether my ATP reviewed papers on COVID-19 were correct or not. I think that I start from the perspective that scientists did try to do their best, but there was not just science in the mix. There was a lot of pressure from media, from social media, from politics, from partisan clashes, from lots of conflicted stakeholders mm -hmm. that measure specific measures were beneficial to them and their businesses and others who were destroyed by some of the measures. So it was everyone in the mix, literally everyone, because everyone could be exposed to the virus. Everyone had some threat, some risk for themselves, for their families, for the whole society. And that created a very explosive environment. I don't think that I have any other example in science where so many stakeholders so mm -hmm. acutely tried to control the evidence, mm -hmm. uh, not even get the evidence, control the evidence uh, ahead of time uh, and uh, fit it to their narrative, their understanding, their expectations, their fears, their panic, their beliefs, their ideology, their partisanship, their science. But that <laughs> comes probably at the very bottom. And that's not easy to do. It's very difficult. In most scientific fields, the pace of evolution is not as acute. The number of stakeholders involved is not that many. Yes, there may be conflicts, but it's typically just the sponsor of mm -hmm. the product. And maybe there's a couple more, but not everyone <laughs> really being involved. And also the people who are interested might be the patients who suffer from the disease or those who might use a technology. And here it was just the entire world with all its ramifications and its very complex ways that people interact under conditions of extreme stress to the system. Mm -hmm. I think that that's very unfortunate and it led to a response that was probably very suboptimal, especially in the US. I think we had uh, horrible outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had outcomes that translate Compared to Sweden, Sweden had fewer deaths once you account for age and gender in the population structure over the years, had fewer deaths during 2020 to 2023 compared to 2017, 2019. Yeah. Negative expected death. Uh, it, it had, it negative, had negative, it had death deficit, not excess yeah. deaths, but death deficits. We had a 16, was, according to the study that you co-authored, 16% excess deaths in, in the U.S. during 2020, 2021. So, so, so the, the, the U.S. W was uh, like a champion of, uh, of excess deaths. Uh, Sweden had, along with New Zealand, the best results in the world with death deficit. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. had massive. If, if, if we had the same outcomes as Sweden, we would have had 1.5 million fewer deaths. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is an extrapolation that is a bit precarious, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think that it gives a bit of the magnitude of, uh, of, of how bad things can go if really your response is problematic and it suffers because of all these problems and all these stakeholders who are, who are just struggling to get the upper hand mm -hmm. in the process. So would a solution be to have more coordination around the research? I mean, if we look at Operation Warp Speed, I mean, that seems to be an incredible success yeah. story. Mm -hmm. 
And it's because all these resources were mobilized with a very specific goal in mind. But uh, if we look back to the Manhattan Project, I mean, the Manhattan Project was, it wasn't simply about developing the atomic bomb. I mean, there was this broader research agenda around trying to understand physics in, in new ways and, and developing this whole new field of, of nuclear physics. Should we have the capacity to scale up research across different academic disciplines in the event of an emergency like this, perhaps coordinated I, I, by I think, NIH or something? I think we can do better in, in that regard. And we, we have successful examples during the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, we uh, published uh, one million papers almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was a lot of very good work that was done. So I don't want to be dismissive of what was the contribution of science, uh, because uh, it was not just science. As I said, there were all these other stakeholders that mm -hmm. kind of modulated and eventually shaped the final outcome beyond what scientists could do. I, I think coordination, yes, could help. Teamwork could help. Lack of polarization would help. I think that do, polarizing... Do scientists play a role in that, or are they sort of the unwitting victims I, I of think that? that most scientists just tried to do their work as well as they could. Some scientists also had social media presence. I, I don't have any social media. Some scientists also had some impact on media. I did appear in media sometimes, especially in the early phases. I realized that the outcome was not really what I would wish because in an, in a polarized environment with, uh, with people kind of predetermined to heroize and to demonize, mm -hmm. this means that whatever you say, if you're visible and notable, you will make millions of people who love you and millions of people who hate you. And both is a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think that you're struggling to say, I'm just a scientist. I know next to nothing. I'm just trying to do some scientific mm -hmm. work. And I'm just trying to tell you a little bit of what I found, but goodness, this is a very complex situation and we do have a major problem. Can we all sit together and just join forces instead of just try to demonize each other? Mm -hmm. In a polarized environment, this is very difficult. Scientists are not trained to be politicians. They're not trained to be taming beasts. And it's a very different job. Mm -hmm. And it's very unfortunate when people who are those who tame beasts and are in the political sphere, instead of trying to find ways to bridge divides and close differences and find a way to have a societal response that is more understanding and more empathy and sympathy mm -hmm. and love for each other, it leads to just a split mm -hmm. and division and, and even situations of disruption in a sense of the, the social fabric. Well, now that I'm teaching finance to doctors, I, I always have to ask this question, which is, here in the US, we, we spend more than anybody else on the planet for healthcare, and we have these horrible outcomes. And that 16% excess mortality number that we see from 2020, 2021, I mean, that was largely due to underlying health conditions, right, which are not addressed. Why do we get so little bang for, for our buck here in, in the US? We have tremendous inequality. We have tremendous unevenness on uh, where that money goes and who is served. And we have lots of people who have very good, excellent, the best healthcare in the world. And they can expect to live to their 90s, maybe 100. But we have a lot of people who are uninsured, a lot of people who are marginalized, a lot of people who are very poor, a lot of people who are exposed to multiple risks, a lot of people who suffer from chronic conditions, some of them from lifestyle, like obesity, even smoking, although there's many countries that have worse problems with smoking than we do, or overdose. We have epidemics within epidemics that are ongoing in our population. We have a lot of vulnerable people. And in a sense, the pandemic took an X-ray of our health system and our society, and it said, the U.S. health system and the U.S. society have many problems. You know, Sweden, healthcare and society, they do have some problems, but overall, they're a very decent society and, and they do care about their citizens and they do take good care of their citizens. So I think in a way we took that exam and, and we failed. Uh, and I think we've, we failed miserably. And it's important to go back and see who are the people who we just let go and who are the people who we didn't care about? 
And it, it's not just for these recent years. These are people that we haven't cared about for a very, very long time. And now they were sacrificed, unfortunately. And the explanation that it's all COVID-19, yes, that was a dangerous virus and uh, we did have a pandemic, but it makes a huge difference if you're having a population that is protected, that you care about your citizens, that you have a health care that will cover the weakest members of our society versus a uh, health care that will just leave them completely to their own fate. Mm -hmm. And we left many people to their own fate. Now, last question. Doctors historically have been well educated people right? and not necessarily specialists. I mean, William Carlos Williams, John Keats were poets, you know, John Locke, philosopher, doctor. I mean, but nowadays doctors, lawyers, other folks, they're usually focused on their craft. Now you've written an opera among other things, which I had the chance to see a couple months ago. I mean, this is a little bit unusual, right? For doctors today, researchers to, to have these broader talents and interests. Do you think that having interest in the humanities and in the arts helps you to be a better doctor? I mean, should we be encouraging doctors to maybe broaden their interests? <laughs> There's no randomized trial to, to right. prove that, but I, I do believe that it's important to have a connection between humanism and medicine in particular. And I, I think science in general would benefit from more of a dialogue and an and interface with the humanities. I feel that humanities are really pitifully so losing a lot of ground in, in modern society. I teach a course on modern poetry at the Department of Comparative Literature at Stanford. And I, I, I always enjoy teaching that every year. It's not a lot of students uh, who take it as is typical of, uh, of humanities, but it, it gives a different dimension. It gives a different uh, approach to understanding art, but also humans and what our world uh, has in terms of values to show. And I, I think I can just not avoid it. I have been writing literature since I was a little kid. I've published nine books already that probably most of my medical and science colleagues have never seen. And I, of course, I don't blame them for that, but maybe they're horrible, who knows? <laughs> and I just cannot avoid it. I love classical music. I write libretti for operas. I hope the one that you saw was not horrible <laughs> either. And it, it's, it, it's an effort to try to step out of the boundaries that a scientific profession may set. And sometimes we tend to think that science is self-contained, but science is about humans, especially medicine is about humans who suffer, who have emotions, who have beliefs, who face big dilemmas in their life and in their death. And I, I don't think that you can answer all of that just with either equations or biological samples or with uh, very fancy analytical methods. W we need something more than that to struggle with our inadequacy. I feel very inadequate all the time. I'm just trying to cover that inadequacy as much as I can. Well, they used to call it the medical arts, right? Yes. At one point. Yes. And so maybe we need to start calling it that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Let's continue the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you for tuning in to the Unsiloed podcast produced by University FM. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and review in your favorite listening app. To listen to our other episodes, please visit our website at www.unsiloedpodcast.com.